So I want to talk about resilience design patterns. And um, OK, so this, is, uh, this was taken by my climbing buddy. And we went climbing. And so I am ecstatic because it's, it's, a, it's, it's a, so much relief because I completed this part of the climb, which is like the crux of the climb. And I quite, it's, I don't know if you can tell from the angle, but it's a, it's a slight overhang, so this is a slight angle. I hate overhangs. And this is like uh, the, the third part of the climb. There was like two more parts after this. This is the, the, the crux of the climb. So I get there and I look at this overhang and I'm already thinking like, crap, I have to do this. And my climbing buddy's already climbed above this point, so I'm, I'm, I'm trying and I missed. So when you miss an uh, overhang, you, you kind of like dangle on the rope. So, so I'm thinking, OK, uh, you know, uh, let me try again. So I try again, and I dangle again. And it's, it's a little bit of effort to get back on an overhang because you're dangling. And there's a little bit of effort trying to get back on the rock and try to make the same move. And um, so. I'm not panicking just yet, but like I'm, you know, lots of thoughts are going in my head. And I, I don't know if you watched the movie For Your Eyes Only, James Bond movie. There's a scene where Roger Moore, like, you know, uh, he's dangling and he takes off his shoelaces and then he like climbs up the rope. And I'm thinking, well, I'm a real climber and I have all the straps, not just shoelaces. So I could possibly climb up the rope. And that's kind of when like my brain said, stop. You are overdoing this. And, and I had a walkie-talkie because it's, it's, it's too far up. And so I pick up the walkie-talkie and I tell myself, don't drop this. Just hold on to it. And you know, so I pick up the walkie-talkie and, and made sure I was on the right channel because the previous time I was on the mountain, we were on the wrong channel. And, and we ended up like not communicating properly. So anyway, um, I call my uh, buddy and I said, like, I'm not quite panicking yet, but I'm kind of getting there. And, and he is like one of those people who's very calm under pressure, and he's, he's like one of those people. And um, so he tells me, like, oh, don't worry, just, you know, rest up. Don't just do half-hearted attempts, just rest up. And then, like, give it your best. And there may be something for your left hand up the top. Like, OK. And uh, so. Finally, I, I try, and I did get up that, and I literally hugged that rock when I got up there. Uh, just for reference, this is kind of where I was dangling. <laughs> so um, you might be wondering, what does this all have to do? What does rock climbing have to do with resilient systems? It turns out like we could learn a lot from climbing, because um, there is a set of techniques uh, like on how you set up these anchors. Because when I was dangling, the anchors were like, you know, the rope goes through these anchor system, and that's kind of what is protecting me at that point. So John Long, he's one of uh, pioneers of climbing, and he's climbed several first attempts in the 1970s when uh, the climbing gear wasn't all that great. So um, he's written several books, and he came up with this system called Serene. So this is like uh, a set of patterns on how you design your anchors. And these anchors potentially save your life. And if you want to climb the next day, and you want to pay attention to how you want to set these anchors up. So it turns out like these principles, like to me, when I learned it, I was like, Oh my God! This relates so directly to distributed systems and, and like how you you know, if you want your systems to be reliable, we could just take these patterns. So, serene stands for solid, redundant, equalized, and no extension. Solid, like in climbing, means like you know you want to look at the bolts and because you're going to be putting your gear on the bolts, so you want to make sure they're not rusty or wiggly because your life depends on it. So if we translate that to software terms, it's your components. Like, how solid are your components? Because ultimately, the components are what make your entire system. So I used to work for this company. It was a, um, in the domain of like mortgages and uh, lending. So there was a lot of regulation. So we were trying to build this new feature where, where like, you know, uh, we have to submit some regulatory information to some of the states. So 
there were five different states, and each of these states had different rules. So we wanted to design it in a, in a nice way, and where it can scale nicely, and, and so on. So we put a lot of thought into designing it correctly, uh, where like the load for one state isn't like, you know, will affect the other. So we put a lot of thought, came up with this really nice design. And um, turns out that the component that was being used was this one component. It worked in production before, so you know the schedule gods, uh, you know, said that we have to stick to the schedule. So we didn't like have time to work on that component, and we knew it had some problems. But hey, it worked. So and also you know reuse, right? So we took that component and. Um, we try to use it in, in all these different modules. So it wasn't the best, but we said, OK, what could go wrong? Well, <laughs> so um, it turns out like that component was pretty bad. It, you know, it had things like swallowing exceptions. And, and so we wanted a way to test uh, like, you know, whether the, these, uh, pro this process works. So we added this cool demo mode. So and in so it was supposed to be something where you go in the configuration file and and turn demo mode on and then it's on. Otherwise, when the demo mode is on, everything will work except the last part of where the document actually gets submitted to the state. So the demo mode was on, and of course we turned it off in production when we deployed. It turns out like this component like had that hard coded in the library in the code as well. So of course we didn't know that when we deployed. When we deployed, it, it's it's one of those strange feelings, right? Like you deploy, everything like seems like it's working fine. Like there are no exceptions, and you think like, wow, this is a great deployment. And then like you know you kind of like like start looking at the logs and the audit logs for all the messages, everything is like lined up. And typically we get responses when we submit the information to the state and nothing came back. So this was one of those cases where there were no exceptions or errors, but the exception was the expected result didn't happen, which was like, you know, the replies didn't come through. So then we started digging, and then we found this cool demo mode thing hard-coded in the library. The CTO was not very happy when we did the rollback. So the, the, story, the point of the story is, like, you know, your system is going to be as stable as all the components that make up the part of the system. So it needs to be solid. Redundant, in, in climbing, we don't ever depend on one piece. We always need redundancy. We need two anchors. We need two carabiners, two straps. So anything um, that you, your life depends on, you double it. So in terms of software, we want to make sure that the most critical business services are also redundant. What happens if uh, this critical service goes down? It can cause an outage. And what does that outage actually translate to in terms of money to the business? So how much money are we losing by this service not being available? So those are the questions we need to ask ourselves. And we need to make sure that the, the, the thing that makes money to the business is critical and it needs to be redundant. The, the third principle is equalized. So yes, we are not going to die because we've set up two anchors. But how you distribute the weight to these two anchors are, is important. So we want to set it up in such a way that we, when we have multiple pieces, all of those pieces t equally take part in that load. So not one uh, piece. If, if, if all the weight of the climber is taken by one piece, th then that piece could break. And that could cause like the other pieces to break. So we want to make sure the weight is uh, equally distributed. So in software, kind of turns so we could take that principle and say, hey, we need to make sure that not only are, are is our business critical services uh, redundant, but we want to make sure that they're load balanced. So um, you could put a load balancer in in front, and but what we need to be careful is. Um, are we using things like sticky sessions? So are we inadvertently, like even though we have a load balancer, are we inadvertently sending traffic just to one instance? Because if that's the case, then eventually 
that instance, like under load, might fail, and, and it could cause problems. So, so these are some of the things that you know, we need to think about. The last principle is, uh, is, is slightly interesting. It's called no extension. No extension here literally means like um, when a piece fails, it doesn't extend the rope. So for example, let's say a piece fails, and the climber is climbing, but he takes a fall. Now, when he takes a fall, like what happens is if this piece pulls out and it suddenly drops the rope by a certain distance, that's going to shock load the, the other pieces. And if it, it, by, by creating that extra shock, those pieces can fail. So if we take this, um, translate this to software terms, we could think of cascading failures. So um, there was this one time when um, we, so, I worked on this service, and as a developer, I was one of those people, it's like, if when my service fails, I have to know about it in production, and because I'm responsible for the service, and, and so I need to know. And I don't care, like, it's my service, so I, I should know even if it fails at 4 a.m. So, um, and at the time, Microsoft Patterns and Practices Group had come up with a bunch of libraries, and it was super easy to, like, take this email alerter thing and attach it to your exceptions and say, okay, like, you know, so when this thing exceptions, and, um, you know, I'm gonna get an email notification. You can set up like several levels of escalations and, and stuff. So I was also on the, on the email thing. So what happened was, as all failures happen, they usually pick the most convenient time, the weekend, to fail. And it happened to be at around 3.30 a.m. So it, it did, and, and for whatever reason, the database had failed. Now, that system, pretty much like all of the services were talking to the same database. It was like one of the legacy systems and you know, we know that, right? <laughs> we, we work with systems like that. So when this failed, of course, the, the service started freaking out and it started like, you know, throwing exceptions and my very cool email alerter started working really, really hard. And of course, the service is on a timer, right? So, so you can imagine the amount of uh, emails that it started building up. And it's not just one service. There are lots of services on that server. So all of them are talking to the same database. All of them are on timers. And so there was suddenly a whole bunch of emails. And uh, we effectively DOSed our SMTP server. <laughs> So, <laughs> so it's, it's, I'm laughing now, but it was not fun. <laughs> so it was, um, yeah, so the poor IT guys, like they not only were trying to fix the database server, but then they had a whole load of emails to catch up and, and clean up. So um, cascading failures are bad. So when we start thinking about like, okay, how, so, how does failure in this service affect the whole system? And we ask questions like that, then we can try to like, you know, model our systems in such a way that you know, it doesn't cause um, a lot of chaos and, and bring other parts of the system down. And there are patterns for that that we can, um, that we can learn from, say, electrical engineering. So uh, my brother, he's very good with electricals and electronics. He's older to me. I learned a lot of cool stuff from him, including sol soldering wires and melting lead. And, in, and uh, <laughs> one of the things uh, in growing up in India is like, like during uh, summer, there's a lot of power outages and power surges, et cetera. So like big things like the TV were behind something that were protected by a fuse. And we had this um, power strip that had this one amp fuse, and it was a pain because, like, you know, what a reason that the fuse always burnt out. The fuse works like this. So when there's a, uh, so the fuse is, has like a little filament of wire in, in the middle, and it connects to two ends of the circuit. So when there's a there's a high power surge, what happens is that filament literally melts and prevents the the flow of current, protecting your very important devices like in my case, my dad's color TV. So, um, but it was a weekend and I was like wanting to watch, 
I can't remember what show, but it must have been important. And so I like the TV isn't working. So I try to like go and troubleshoot. I think I was probably around like ninth grade or so I was old enough to be more trouble. So um, so I go and figure out like, OK, and this thing, uh, this, this TV isn't working. And then I finally figure out it's the fuse that got burnt out. Of course, we don't have another fuse. So I did a very, very awesome thing of like trying to, my brother has a lot of stuff, so I went into his stuff and pulled a copper wire and, you know, I tried to stick it in and I got electrocuted. So, uh, <laughs> so, um, and, I, you know, my mom felt bad, but I think if the TV had blown up, I would have been in bigger trouble. <laughs> So, um, so the the thing is like okay, so the fuses. The problem is like the fuse literally melts, and you have to keep replacing fuses. So uh, solving it um, with a circuit breaker is a is a much better way, where it's electromagnets, so the thing doesn't die all the time. And if if it, the principles are the same, it detects the surge and it trips the circuit breaker, and it shuts down uh, the power. But the reset part is easy. You just go flip a switch, and everything is fine. So. We can take this aspect and build it in our software. So um, what if, like, you know, a critical resource like, you know, for example, like the DOS attack that I did to my SMTP server. So a critical resource was not available. So I could have detected that and I could have said, like, hey, you know, this is essential for the database is essential. Without the database, the service is like no use. So if the database isn't essential, I could like bring this system down. So I could have detected that condition of a critical resource not available, and then act on the or act on that condition, and I could have brought that system service down. If I had done that, then I wouldn't have overloaded the the email server. So this pattern can be quite. Uh, quite useful. So pseudocode, if you want to uh, do this, uh, you might have a class and you probably have some sort of like retries, like, you know, how long you, you might want to wait between these retries and what action you, should you take when you've exhausted the retries and all that time delay that you've added, when you finally figured out this is no good, the database is really, really down. So what action do you need to take? And in most cases, we do a fail fast and, and bring the service down. So um, the methods are trip and reset, just like the circuit breaker, it's something to trip and something to reset. And um, the, the, the dashes are just bullet points, not private methods. So <laughs> for those of you, um, so if you were to kind of use this, this is how it look. You new up your circuit breaker and uh, you give it retries and how long to wait and pretty much like what action needs to be called uh, when, when the circuit breaker gets uh, tripped. So if you want to unit test this, so you throw an exception and, you know, the circuit breaker gets stripped and wait like longer than whatever the time specified and make sure that the action got called. And same thing um, when you trip, but if, if that action was reset before the, the entire time was elapsed, then, you know, you make sure that the, the, the circuit breaker trip action did not get executed. So this is a simple pattern that we can take from electrical engineering, from the concept of fuses and circuit breaker, and bring it in our code. In fact, um, at particular software, um, in, in service bus, and service bus is a library that sits on top of uh, queuing and um, gives you nice abstra abstraction to do some things like retries and, and, and other deduplication patterns. And so one of the things that we do is because queuing is a very important resource, if, for example, say RabbitMQ isn't up and, and we're trying to send messages, we detect that, hey, I can't talk to the broker, the broker is down. So whatever that service is, the service will fail fast and shut down. So this, this pattern is implemented um, in, in end service bus in that fashion. So um, looking at real world, I like love Starbucks. Uh, I don't know about you. I, I go there almost every day, and, and now I'm trying not to go there every day. Anyway, so um, if we look at real world, Starbucks does not work like this, where you, when you're trying to get a drink, you walk to the cashier, and you say, hey, this is the drink I want. 
the cashier does not go over to the barista and stand and wait until the barista makes the drink and gives it back and then the cashier walks back. That does not happen in Starbucks. And, but sometimes we write code like this. And when we write code like this, we're temporally coupled. We've added an uh, element of coupling uh, at, at runtime where if one service isn't available, for example, if the barista isn't available, the cashier cannot complete what the cashier is supposed to do, in which case this is charge the card, just because he couldn't get the drink object back. So this is the problem that can keep you from scaling up. And because like, once your software hits a certain load, it's, it's not like a lot of hardware that you add in that can solve a problem. If you have places like this in your, in your code, in your, in your system, these are the points that you need to figure out, like how do we decouple so both these uh, services can be autonomous and reliable. So the answer is like, oops, okay. Um, the answer is like, in real world, Starbucks works like this. You have the cashier and you have the barista. You go to try to get a drink. What happens is the cashier does what the cashier is supposed to do, processes your credit card, and then um, publishes this message. So in the case of Starbucks, they take your order, write like your name, and like pretty much like whatever drink you wanted on the cup and leave it on the table for the barista. Now, the barista then picks up that message or that cup and prepares the drink. And, and that's the barista's job. Once the drink is done, then they just announce like, hey, Indu, your, your hot chocolate's ready or whatever, right? So this is kind of how uh, real life works. So if we take this, and apply to our software, then we would be introducing messages and queues. And so this particular pattern is called PubSub, Publish, Subscribe, but there are over 100 patterns in the book Enterprise Integration Patterns by Gregor Hope and Bobby W. I'm pretty sure I'm not <laughs> pronouncing their names right. So, so here, like the key is we're not losing requests, but we're keeping those requests in, in durable persistence. And you can think of using uh, uh, some messaging broker like um, uh, durable functions or RabbitMQ or, you know, as your, as your broker to get these messages in a durable way. So the good thing about this model is, let's say, you know, for whatever reason, the barista is down. It does not affect the cashier service at all because the cashier can still be servicing people and then like queuing up these cups on the barista's table. And you know, it, it doesn't matter. The barista can be down, the cashier can be up. Same thing, like um, the cashier could be down, but the barista you know, is going to service all the messages in the queue. So they're gonna keep preparing drinks for all the, all the existing orders and keep you know, producing those drinks out. So this, in this model, things are, these two services are both autonomous and they can scale up and down. So let's say there's a sudden, like, you know, um, it's rush hour and, and there's like 20 people on the line. So they can like, like in, include another cashier and to get these, um, get these you know, people helped quicker. So same thing, if, if there's a lot of cups lined up, you can like pull in another barista to, to service this. So it gives you a more natural model where you are able to scale and be reliable and be autonomous. So, um, so this is like a real world pattern. Now, um, control systems engineering is, is another uh, very interesting uh, very interesting part of engineering, originally from applied math, but pretty much it, it can be, it, it can stand on its own. Pretty much like you're probably used to control systems uh, in day-to-day -day life, like if you use cruise control in your car or like if you have a central air conditioner in your house, pretty much like there's a lot of things that, that use the control system. So what is it? Um, let's say you're going camping and uh, you light up this uh, campfire and you know the wood keeps burning 
And at some point, the wood you know, runs out, and you start getting cold. You detect that. And then you manually go in and throw a couple of extra logs to make it warm. So this would be a manual control system where you're doing the work manually or uh, what is called as open loop control system where the feedback isn't like there's nothing actionable. It, everything is manual. Now, obviously, this works great in camping, but it wouldn't work so well in your house. So if you, uh, you want to you know, have uh, a, a system that's in your house, you want to you want to make sure, I mean, th this is a little bit more sophisticated, where you probably have sensors. You have a desired temperature that's set. And, you, you know, whatever. Like, so when the desired temperature, you know, um, reduces or something, you've got the sensors that detect the difference in value. And it takes that input and feeds it back. And now, like, the heater can kick in and say, OK, it's cold. And, and so we need to warm the house up a little bit more. So there's this feedback mechanism, and, and this sort of control system is called a closed-loop feedback. So basically, you've got three, three things. What is the current actual value? What is the set point or the desired value? And what is the error value? So the error value is just the difference between what's your optimal and the current. So now you take this error value, and then you apply some fancy math. If you ever wondered what's the use of all that calculus and differential equations that you learned, uh, it turns out pretty pretty useful in in this case. So you could uh, you could like you could apply basically um, some proportional rate or diff different. You can apply different models of math to this error value and feed it back and you know make adjustments. So what? How you change this, like what mathematical models you use, it really depends on like how stable you want the system to be. So um, one aspect is uh, the control system is called the PID loop, where it takes like three parts, uh, proportional, which is like the rate of change, and applies some integral uh, math, so like the calculates the area of that change, and also a derivative uh, function. So it applies all three of these to the error value and comes up with what should be the optimal value and how the controller should react in, in bringing this um, you know, value up or down. So, so if you just use one, like the proportional one, you could have a lot of oscillations. The system may not be stable. It might you know, increase and then decrease. And, and so you don't want that oscillation. So you apply all these three values to, to keep it more stable. Now, it turns out that Amazon uh, uses this technique uh, in, in some of their services in, in how they, like, you know, you could think of, like, auto scaling as a great example. You have a certain load, and so you have some desired value where you want to be, and, and you could apply these sort of techniques to kind of automatically make some decisions on when you want to automatically, you know, scale up or scale down. And um, so... The, the uh, brings me to this part, which is like, OK, so we are designing a lot of this for being reliable. And we take so much care for you know, architecting the right way and building our models correctly. But to me, this is like something that's super important, like learning from what we've already built in order to get a better understanding. So this is a really sad picture of uh, the Notre Dame. And so on that fateful morning, the guy that was on the job, it was his the, on the, monitoring the security monitor. It was just his third day on the job. So he was a brand new guy. And he had already worked the night before. And the person that was supposed to relieve him in the morning didn't show up. So he was on the you know, he was on a double, double shift. So, and then this sort of warning comes up. And like, wow, okay, so there's fire, and there's, uh, it, it mentions some zone, and there's some cryptic numbers, and, you know, something aspirating whatever framework. So he takes this information, and he calls the guy in, in the church to let him know, hey, there's a fire alert. And you know you need to go check it out, and the way the so 
he relayed the information as is. They were trying to figure out between the two of them where the fire was, and they had to uh, manually verify the fire before they could call the fire department. So they unfortunately went to the wrong part of the church, the wrong attic, and they checked and there was no fire. But the fire was in a different part of the church, in the main attic. So I think about 20 to 30 minutes was lost in this time. And so the fire was like really bad. And it, it took the bravery and courage of uh, firefighters to, to save the structure. Now, the sad part is it took six years to design the system. So the, the way the system is designed is there's a bunch of like these uh, cool detectors. And these detectors were placed in the attic. And there were hundreds of them. And the job of this detector is to suck up air and to see if there is smoke or not. And if there is smoke, it raises the alarm. So the way this alarm is, it's like fire, and then it, it specifies the zone. Apparently, there are four zones in the church, and this is just a zone identifier. And then the, the ZDA, whatever, it's like probably the, the actual aspirator that detected the fire, the number. And then the key was the aspirating framework, which said it was the, the smoke the detector <coughs> framework that detected the fire. But unfortunately, six years of, you know, of dozens of people pouring lots of work in designing this system, they couldn't prevent the one thing it was designed for, which is detecting fire, sadly. Now, the people that designed it, you know, there were certain risks that they had to take into account. Now, they had um, decided not to have firewalls. Firewalls is like, like a, a containment where, you know, the, by building these different firewalls, you want to make sure that if there's a fire in this part of the church, it doesn't spread to the other areas. So the, I think that they, you know, I'm sure they must have been like uh, a lot of decisions that went into whether we want, like it must not have been an easy decision to not include firewalls or to not include sprinklers. They, part of the reason was they wanted to retain the original wooden lattice of the church. So there's a lot of, risks that they did take into account. And, but the constraints were, were difficult too. So the, the ceiling was made of stone. So the firefighters just couldn't like, you know, get, get to the bottom of the church and shoot water up because the, the ceiling was made of stone. And the firefighters had to climb a winding staircase of 300 stairs to get to the area of the fires. So that was also complicated. So it's it's kind of hard in the case of Notre Dame. It's you know they're trying to retain the or, or original church as is, and they they went through this pain. But as software engineers, like I think our life is a little bit easier of detecting these conditions and you know of um, of working through them. So, for example, like you know we need to ask ourselves like what is the risks that that you know can cause uh, for our business, like you know, our by can the can the what is the outage cost in terms of money? So we need to to ask those kinds of questions, and more importantly, I think the easy part is coming up with the design or software. The hard part is uh, collaborating with all the stakeholders. So we need to make sure that like when we design a system, we talk to the right. Uh, right people in the room to make sure the software that we're modeling and building is actually the right software. If, if someone had taken that, you know, cryptic um, error alert and given it to the guy that was actually whose job was to monitor it and ask him, hey, can you make sense of this? Can you tell me where the fire is? And, and if that guy couldn't figure it out in a second, then we have a problem. So, so these are some things that we can do in, in how we collaborate. And to me, this is like the more finer part or the more difficult part because talking to people is always hard. So, so um, I want to leave you with this quote from John Long. It's like, when we, decide, when we build systems, we shouldn't be at the mercy of them. Like, you know, they should serve us. We shouldn't have to... We shouldn't have to hope, you know, hope for the best and not break. 
you know, we, we design things in a way that works, but we also want to take all of this information and keep, you know, learning from our systems and make changes. We don't want to wait six years, but we put a model out. We want to take that information and we want to see how it reacts and, you know, even look for hallway conversations if, if you know, based on the domain expert, if, if they are indicating a slight change in the behavior, that's important enough for us to act. Take that, you know, change behavior, incorporate that in our code, have a newer model. So by constantly evolving our system, we would be more aligned to what the business needs. Our goal as architects or programmers or leads or whoever we are is to write the correct software, the, the, the software that's going to help the business move forward. So I think that's, that's our job. And I'm going to leave you with these resources, um, a link to uh, two InfoQ talks, which talks a little bit more in detail if you want to learn about like how Amazon applies this control theory um, to do the auto scaling. There's a great one hour talk. And also there's an another talk from a DevOps engineer on how use control theory to, um, to uh, manage uh, orchestration for containers. So, and I'm just curious here, who here has read Eric's DDD book, the blue book? Awesome. Who has read the second part of the book? Awesome. So <laughs> refactoring towards deeper insight is part three in Eric's book. So if you get to part three, that's where all the good stuff is. And uh, thank you so much for having me here. I hope you have a great rest of the conference.